Jay, what's the deal next week? Like, are we doing this live stream thing or because I, I haven't seen anything? People are asking. Yeah, I want to do it. I'm actually really psyched. So I, I had this all planned out. I haven't quite figured out all the details. Um, yeah, how about this? For anybody that's listening. So um, this is what I want to do. Anybody that's listening that wants to join in on the live stream next week, basically watch this episode or the next episode live as we record it. Tuesday, January 25th. So next Tuesday, 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, I don't have the link yet. I haven't quite figured out the details, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a URL. I actually already bought the URL, DRE, so drunk real estate, DRE live.com. If anybody goes there, just give me your email address, put your email address in there. In the next couple of days, I will send you instructions on how to join the live stream next week because I have to figure it out. Um, so drelive.com or you can go to jscott.com and I have a link right at the top for, for doing the same thing. So just drop me your email address and, and we'll figure it out. So, I mean. Nice. I'm pumped, man. It's going to be awesome. I know. I'm really excited. I assume you want to still do this. Yeah, let's do it. Welcome to Drunk Real Estate. Grab a drink and enjoy the show. Hey there, welcome to episode 52 of Drunk Real Estate. I am Kyle Wilson, Ashley Wilson's husband, and I'm joined again with my three co-hosts, starting with Mr. Jay Scott. How's it going, Jay? Doing great. I'm excited. I mean, this is this is going to be a fun week, but next week is going to be even more exciting with our live stream of our predictions episode. So I'm 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 psyched. Yeah, you drinking tonight, or are you uh, taking another week off? I'm taking another week off. I'm. I'm oh, come I'm, on! I, I, I got so get, proud of you, Jay. I got my. I got to get my summer body back, and but what that means is I need to be able to be able to walk around with a shirt on. Like I don't even need to be able to take my shirt off. Do we got to change the name of this podcast, or are we sticking with drunk real estate? Because like the, the whole point was that we get a little bit drinking and we start saying things we wouldn't normally say. And that's what makes the podcast great. If we're all reserved and be like, oh, I'm not sure I should say that, then it's not going to be a fun podcast. I'll make you do. I'll do all extra drinking next week for the live stream. Uh, what, at three times extra? What's this? Three, three I in a row? Th- I will do three times extra next week for the live stream. This week, I'm going with my fruit smoothie and I'm going with my decaf green tea. Get my vitamins. I'm getting my minerals. I'm getting my... Uh, my getting my a colonoscopy vitamins. in the morning or something? What is That's your dinner? Don't be jealous. <laughs> All right, Mauricio, please tell me that you have something for me. Dude, I just got back from an amazing weekend hanging out with some of our favorite economists. I was talking to, I uh, was dropping some names for Jay. Jay was impressed with some of the name dropping I did. No, I'm not. Uh, I was at the uh, Real Estate Guys uh, Summit before they got on the ship. I didn't go on the ship, but I was at it for the first couple of days. So uh, they always have some interesting. Are they uh, back on the ship? Because they were doing it. They were doing it like on sand for a while. Yeah, they're right? back, it's back they... on the ship. So they actually had, you know, Tom, uh, Tommy Hopkins, who's one of the top salespeople of all times, wrote a bazillion books. He usually goes because he loves cruising and he hasn't been going the last few years, but he's back. Peter Schiff was there with his family. So always good to catch up with Peter. And then I was actually particularly Particularly excited because Brent Johnson, who's the author of the um, Dollar Milkshake Theory, which was one of our more popular episodes we did about a month ago, uh, he was there. I'd never met him before, so I got to spend some time on him. Actually, was on stage with him for for the live podcast. It's just the two of us on stage together. So that was fun to spend some time with him. And uh, just overall, it was a good uh, good weekend. So I'm, I'm back. And, uh, and I am here with my new favorite drink in support of my co-hosts. The Red Cup, the Diet Coke, the Diet Coke to support AJ and also Jay. Uh, and yes, I think we should probably change the name of the podcast. Here's what I'm doing, though. You know that 70, the problem is I'm doing, you know, 75 hard. You heard about 75 hard. You guys know about 75 hard, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It okay. sucks. Many, many years ago. So last year I came up with something called 30 easy. So it was like a 30 day thing. And it was a little bit, and I, you know, I had to think I've now come up with 10 ridiculous. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm doing the 10 ridiculous, which I can go through it if you want, but it includes no alcohol. So I got to do this one more, one, one episode here, and then I'll be back drinking uh, next week because that's when it's over. But I'm doing the 10 ridiculous. So I got to do it. I, I'm just finishing up 5,000 lazy. <laughs> yeah. So wait, so you are drinking no alcohol either? That's correct. I got a 10 day. I'm on day, I'm on day three or something. So I'll, I'll be, I'll be good next week, but uh, yeah, no alcohol for 10 days. 
should we just cancel this week or like do you guys want to finish this off i feel like that's pretty prejudice against me kyle well no the point was is that like aj you are already kind of a like a, a bit of an offside guy so like you get away with not having to drink because you just say things that are over the line anyway. We're going to say stuff that's over the line here no matter what. We're going to do it no matter whether we're sober or we're drunk. It doesn't matter. We're going to do it. Other people need to get, like, they need to get their alcohol levels up to say the crap that I say. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You were just telling us the story of some of the things that you say to your investors. And and Jay, I could tell he he might have... He might have pooped his pants a little bit when he he was hearing the thing that you were saying. <laughs> so AJ, but let's switch this up. Maybe you're drinking. I don't know. Like it's it's opposite day apparently. Let's let's hear it. <laughs> <I'm plastered, guys. laughs> uh no, sorry. Uh, uh I'm still doing my Diet Coke. I switched up the cup tonight, and now that Mauricio was at the red cup, I feel like I let him down. Like, you did kind of feel bad about it, but I was going to draw in like the drunk real estate logo on the cup and say it was a, you know, a logo, but I didn't get around to it. But AJ, what happened to uh, Ernie there? Uh, he, he got moved, he got moved around. So he's doing good though. He's doing good. He's still okay. What are you drinking, Kyle? Well, I guess I have to like make up for it. So I brought two bottles that you guys <laughs> could to pick from, but I might just have to drink them both. But it was Father's Day, and so now, like, this is, like, our thing, like, drunk real estate, so I thought, but apparently not. So now people, like, whenever it's, like, a a gift-giving holiday, they just give me booze. And so I got two bottles of this, uh, it's called Dad's Hat for Father's Day. It's a Pennsylvania rye. Um, and they gave me two, and I don't really know which one to drink because they seem like the same, but... I'm not even going to give you guys a privilege. Of Drink one, one each, one each. That's what I did with the Pisco that one time. I tried one of them, and then I tried the other one in the middle of the show. Well, these are both so similar. They're both small batch. They're both rye whiskeys. They, the, the alcohol content is 2% different. So the proof is like 90 proof versus 94 proof. Uh, the only difference is this one is finished in the last three months are in vermouth barrels. So I might try that one. I don't know. Let's give it a go. Anyway, all right. I'm you guys. I'm not gonna lie. I'm so demotivated for this episode now that no one's drinking. I feel like it's like we're we're like a a scam. We're like scamming everybody. It's we got to like change the name of the episode or something. But. Okay, let's jump in. Let's jump. In. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, grumpy over there. Yeah, you're grumpy because you haven't had a drink. <laughs> we're just drunk on real estate this week. That's all. We're drunk on real estate. Okay. Yeah, we should get that website too. I guess. Um. All right. <sighs> Fine. You'll make up for us, Kyle. Come on, right, Kyle. Kyle. Step We're it up. Hammered. Step it yeah. up, buddy. Right, Step it took, up. Uh, Don't let the audience down. Don't let them we, down. <laughs> we took a week off last week for, uh, to do an amazing deflation debate. I thought it was better than any presidential debate ever could be. We didn't need podiums. We didn't need a mute button. Though I do think maybe Jay should have had a mute button, but we we went without one. Um and I think we crushed it, but we need to get back to reality here. We need to give the nerds what they want, and they what they want is Jay's economic update. So we've had a few different reports come out in the last two weeks, uh, but none were more influential than last week's CPI report. If you listen to the headlines, month over over month, over month CPI was 0.0, .0 which my math isn't always great, but Jay, if you annualize 0, 0.0, isn't that less than 2%? It is. It, it's it's actually pretty close to if I if my math is is correct, it's pretty close to zero. Okay, so um, what's the deal with that? Yeah, so I, I think it's good that we had a couple episodes over the last month or two. We had an episode where we talked about stagflation. We had an episode where we talked about deflation. We're not, I don't think, anywhere close to either of those, but we are certainly trending in a direction that would lead us to say, hey, we should start thinking about these things. So uh, we're, we're seeing major inflation cooling over the last month, I guess. Uh, we've seen a lot of data that's come out the last week or two uh, for May. And while I wouldn't say we're in like a recession, I wouldn't say that we're, we're seeing a softening yet, um, but we're definitely seeing a normalization. We're seeing a, a normalizing of, of the economy back to where we were back before COVID. And potentially, if we keep going in this direction, we're seeing we're going to see a slowdown. 
or we're going to see a recession, or we're going to see stagflation, or we're going to see deflation. So not ready to, to, to start throwing those words around just yet, but I will say that that we are- Yeah, one week to figure it out, Jay. Predictions episode next week. So you, you threw basically every option there. <laughs> well, I, I think we need to, I, I said this last week or two weeks ago that I, I think the next couple months are going to be really, really important in terms of data. Uh, but May was, May, 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 excuse me, was pretty telling. So let's talk about what happened in May. So number one, you mentioned CPI data. So month over month, um, uh, uh, inflation increased by the government's numbers in May was 0%, um, which means that prices across the board didn't rise in May. So that that's huge. It's, it's, it's the first time we've seen that since last year. And uh, it, it's been a, a good downward trend over the last few months. Um, and if you eliminate, and we've talked about this before, I've talked about this before, if you eliminate shelter and energy from... Um, from from CPI, we're actually below zero. So prices are actually coming down if you get rid of uh, shelter and energy. And we talked it on, on previous episodes why I believe it's reasonable to to eliminate those two. Um, but basically, as of but usually May, they usually they disallow they take out food, isn't it? I thought. Yeah, normally it's food and energy. That's the core. But we've talked about shelter before and how shelter is a, a heavily lagging piece of data and how we rely on. Um, normal people, you and me and, and other people to kind of figure out what they think their houses would rent for to determine this number. And, and we're not necessarily good at that. And so uh, I, I would argue that that shelter, if you pull it out, isn't really going to to impact CPI in, in a way that's that's going to make things less reasonable. I think it's more reasonable to pull shelter out. So long story short, and, Jay, um, and if you, and if Jay, and if, but if you put, if you put eggs back in, then that bumps up the numbers a lot, right? You, you know, it's funny. I, I've, I've thought about it about 10 times today that I need to look up what happened with eggs last month and I forgot to do it, but I, I promise you while one of you guys is talking, I'll, I'll go look up and see what happened with eggs last month. I thought the prices went up. I thought you said the prices of eggs went up. We're going to have to start looking at core inflation, super core inflation and eggless core inflation, I guess. To, in order, to <laughs> eggs have been up the last couple of months due to uh, to to the bird flu, due to a couple of fires at at some large production facilities. So yes, egg, eggs have been up the last few months, but I don't know what happened with eggs last month. Is it just um, me, or do birds seem to get the flu every single year at this point? <laughs> yeah, because they, well, they don't have to access to flu shots. AJ, they don't. Yeah. They, they don't. Well, why can't we expand medical coverage to birds? I just don't understand this. <laughs> I'm going to add that to our topic list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back on track. So, so CPI inflation um, basically uh, coming down in May, and the number sorry, was. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, eggs actually went down five point eight percent. There we go. We're not going to get through this segment, am I? <laughs> <laughs> we got to interrupt you, Jay. Otherwise, you go on seven, eight minute soliloquies here. So we got to we got to jump in to get our things on. Well, I, I've got a lot. I've got a lot to talk about because there are a lot. There's a lot of data that came out the last two weeks. I'll make it quick. So that's CPI. If you look at CPI, all indications are that that May was a good month. Inflation kind of normalizing, getting back to to where the Fed wants it. In addition to CPI, we also saw PPI, which is the um, producer price uh, um, index, which measures wholesale product costs. So basically the cost that uh, businesses are buying products for. This was even more of a surprise than CPI. So we were expecting 0.1% month over month growth, which would have been a good number. Um, that puts us at around 1% per year, which is, is about where you want the PPI to be. But what we saw in May was negative 2%. So basically, uh, the cost of goods that businesses are buying, manufacturers are buying, dropped by 2% month over month in May, which is great. Uh, not necessarily great in terms of how it could impact jobs if, if manufacturers, um, if this means that we're softening and cooling and manufacturers need to lay people off. But in terms of, of inflation, a negative number for the PPI is, is really good. Uh, it, you look at the core PPI, which is another important number, which is basically the the PPI minus food and energy. That was at 0% for the first time since last summer which was great. So overall, PPI is another indication that uh, inflation is cooling. Third big n uh, number that came out that gives us reason to believe inflation is cooling is we saw import prices. So basically, we measure the price of goods that we're getting from other countries, goods that we're importing. And that 
tells us a couple things. One, it's related to the strength of the dollar. If the dollar is stronger, those prices should be lower for us. Um, but also it gives us an idea of how other economies are faring. Um, if they're seeing inflation or if they're storing, starting to normalize, because we don't want to see the world um, experience inflation because we're a global economy now. And if other countries are experiencing inflation because we import $3 trillion per year in, in goods, uh, it's going to impact our inflation. So we want to see import prices coming down. And what we saw in May was import prices were actually down 0.4%, which is huge. Uh, we were expecting it to be even, which would, would have been a great outcome, but we were actually down 0.4%, which annualizes to about 5% a year, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, a lot of that was energy, but even if you take energy out, we were still down 0.3%. So import prices coming down. I was going to say, that's a lot of numbers you're, you're throwing out there. Um, so I don't know if you want me to, to bring up a chart because maybe to mix it up a little bit, but if you want to finish your 20 minute uh, soliloquy, go ahead. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll, I'll do the, I'll do the other ones real quick. Uh, number four. And so we had CPI, PPI, import price. And the other, the, the fourth thing that really was a good news uh, for inflation last month was retail sales. 0.1% uh, growth of, uh, versus 2.2% point, point, point expected growth. Um, if you get rid of automobiles, we were actually negative for retail sale growth last month. Um, we saw negative 0.4% decline in spending at restaurants, um, which may not be a good uh, indicator for where the economy is heading. But it likely means that we're going to see food prices and 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 uh, restaurant uh, prices come down over the near future because we're seeing smaller demands there, uh, lower demand there. And then you think it's April all because of the cyber truck? <laughs> what about the cyber truck? They can't we fit just through drive through. It was the retail sales with the, with the car sales. I, like I just didn't. I got so I was on the reservation list for a cyber truck, and I just got alerted that it's ready and available. And the only one that's available is like the founder's edition. It's a hundred thousand dollars starting price, go up to like a hundred and fifty. Dude, you can flip that thing and make a nice little fifty grand profit. No, they already see. Did you see what they did? They 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 restricted it. It's like a penalty of fifty thousand dollars if you resell the car in the first year or something. It's like Ferrari. They think they're Ferrari now. Maybe maybe that was impacting cost. And then the last thing I'll say for retail sales was we saw a revision of the April number. The April number was actually 0% growth, uh, which was was good to see, a good indication for, for inflation cooling. Uh, but now we're actually, with the revision, we saw April sales numbers as a decline in growth in April. So between CPI, PPI, our import prices, retail sales, basically all indications are that we're normalizing um, – Inflation is coming down, at least temporarily. Don't know if this is a blip or if this is a trend. Uh, we'll know more, obviously, over the next couple of months. But long story short, it's it's a good sign for the economy. And we had a Fed meeting too, right? Which the the interesting thing about the Fed meeting that not a lot of people knew, that was at the exact same day that that CPI data came out. And even though they, they're coming at the same time, apparently Powell and all the members had that CPI data in hand when they were making their decisions. And most members decided not to update their forecasts, even though they got those CPI. Numbers. Well, why wouldn't they? We're still nowhere near 2%. Like their goal, their target's supposed to be 2%. We're year over year at 3.3, 3.4, whatever it was. Why would they start thinking about raising rates if we haven't even gotten down to two yet? We're still at 3.4. Well, can, can I can I take the counter argument to that? The, the counter argument is when they did the six rate cut prediction beginning of the year, they had us finishing the year at 4% unemployment and 2.6% core inflation. We are basically 2.7 core inflation or 2.8, like it depends on how you round, and 4% unemployment. So we've basically hit the targets for the end of the year, which they had said they were going to have six rate cuts. So the counter argument to that is it's trending almost better than what they had predicted with six rate cuts. So why haven't they cut already? Because they're not close. I mean, let me just share this thing because this is straight out of the of the BLS where the this report comes from. So it's like it's actually the source. Because you know me, I like to get to the I like to get to the source of the stuff. But here's a graph actually from uh, from the last year, basically of what CPI. The, the everybody's harping on the zero percent. But if, if you're listening to this and not watching, this is a graph that starts from May of last year. And you'll see a, a year ago, we were down to, came all the way down to 0.1, not quite 0.0, but 0.1. And 
And then over the last few months, it quint quintupled, right? From to from 0.1, doubled to 0.2, then it went up to 0 0.5, then down to and then it came back down again in October to 0 0.1. And yeah, then that's again. the problem. That's why no one looks at headline CPI, is headline CPI is so affected by like gas prices and food prices that are so volatile. That's why they use the core the core PCE. And if you look at the core PCE, which is what they use for that 2% target, they don't care if CPI gets to, to 2%. They care if core PCE gets to. And they made their predictions and they said, we want it to be at 2.6 at the end of the year. And they are, they're, they, that could, we could get that next month. Understood. But I, I mean, I, I, let me pull up the graph for the PCE. But I mean, is, is the PCE trend? I mean, I've, I've got to assume it was a sim similar in terms of coming down uh, in May and then it turned around and went started going back up in, in April, May, June. And then it came back down. I mean, it's, it's a roller coaster just because you can't just pick a, a random time in May that it, it went down. So all I'm saying is that I, I wouldn't I'm not saying it's it, until we see the rest of the month. I'm just not making any huge jumps on one month of data that's my point here because if you if you just look at one month you've yeah. seen it hit the, that those numbers before and then they just turn around and go back up and there's no reason to believe that's not going to happen again this time so i just i'm not ready to jump into some tremendous i completely agree with you mauricio it's it it needs to be a very sustained trend now this also though goes to kyle's point they'll be too late and and two i think we've talked about this but they are always too late but that's the very nature of the beast they're too late right? Because they don't want to do anything until they have seen very sustained trends. But by the time you see that, because it's laggard data. So Kyle's right in that. By the time they see that, it will almost always been be too late because it's this retro look. But also, I think it's important to know, I, that's not the only metric that they're looking at. You, and so I think they're looking at a whole bunch of other metrics and information. And I've kind of been shocked by the fed when they say certain things are important, then it doesn't really seem like that's important at all. And, you know, it's the, so the weighted average of the things that they look at, um, depending on what it's going through, they were way too late to raise interest rates way too late. That was so painfully obvious. Right. And uh, the, some of the indicators that I think held them back, from raising interest rates, uh, where this, this whole idea of transitory, right? Actually, I don't believe that it had anything to do with that. I, I think they totally knew. They certainly weren't at least agreed upon the effects of COVID and if the government was going to shut down again or not. That's why they did it. Because they couldn't raise interest rates and have the government go back into a lockdown and implode the economy. So I think they were looking and saying, all right, yes, it's true. We're having inflation, but it's transitory, but they were really holding off, right? They were waiting to see what the government, what the effects of COVID and everything else were doing. And I think it was just too little, too late. And then they had to jack it up. So there is this laggard effect, but also I think they're definitely making moves for things that don't have to do with core PC. And that includes elections. That absolutely includes the state of the economy politics, the state of everyone in America, social, everything else. And I think they are terrified right now to make any adjustments that would seem favorable or unfavorable to a candidate. And if they don't think that there's going to be either a recession that makes them need to act or something like that, they're not going to, they're not going to go all of a sudden right before fall. Hey, everybody, we're going to stop. We're going to start dropping interest rates right into the election season. Um, I think that's a huge factor here. I, I got a question for you guys too. Um, would you say the rest of the year, you think that unemployment is going to stay exactly the same? Or would you say it's, you know, it's been trending up. We started down three and a 3.4 and we've slowly, steadily just come up. We're at 4.0. Do you think month over month, every month, we're just going to kind of stay at 4.0? Because the Fed does. They, when they came out with their product predictions, they said, we are going to end this year at 4.0 unemployment, which is where we're at right now. So for them to have their rosy predictions of, oh, we're going to have one rate cut, like that's with them assuming we're going to have 4.0 unemployment. So what are they going to do if we actually hit four and a half? So I think it, it, first of all, I don't think that they actually care really. If you look at historical norms, that may be their prediction, but it's still really under a historical norm or average. 
So until it gets above those types of levels, I don't think they're going to be very active. I, I just don't because once again, I, uh, they're not going to want to do so. So if they can stay within norms and not get out of control, it's not like, once again, not recession. Right now, they're not going to do anything. And yes, I do. I think you're absolutely right. Unemployment's going to go up. I think employment numbers will continue to drop. And, and so at what level do they do they say, OK, that's enough? Because the Fed has a dual mandate. Yes, they have an inflation mandate, but they have employment mandate, too. And if they they believe that apparently that, oh, this this tick up of unemployment that we've seen steadily coming up, we're done. It's not going to go up any higher. December this year, we're still going to be at 4.0. If they see an opposite trend where we continue to go up, at what point do they say, OK, we have a problem? Maybe we do that quarter point rate drop. Like, where, where is that? So if you look at the United States, 4%, we're at 3.6 right now. Unemployment, we're at 4. We're at 4. Okay, so 4 is the historical low. So prior to this, we've had one other point, what, a 3.7? And that was in, you know, whatever that was, 19. And then unemployment hit 4% in 2000. But that, that, that is the historic bottoms. So we are below and have been below the absolute historic bottom. So that's what I'm saying. I, I, they have, they're like, what, what are the, what, five? The, the problem there is that um, if you were to ask most economists what the single best leading indicator of a recession is, they would tell you it's this thing called the SOM rule. Um, named after a woman, I think she had an economist, I think it was Claudia, Claudia Sam. Um, and basically what she proposed and the data supports it is that it's not a particular number of, of unemployment that is a, um, an, an indicator, a, a trigger for, uh, uh, recession, but instead it's a moving average. And so if we see, and, and Kyle, I see what you're doing with your fingers exactly right. Um, if, Basically, what she what she proposed was if we see uh, unemployment numbers go up a half point above the one year uh, above the three month, tra the lowest three month trailing average over the last year. So take the lowest three month average over the last year. If we get a half point above that, that is the single best leading indicator for um, for uh, uh, recession. Right now, if you look at the lowest three-month average for the last 12 months, we're at, I think, 3.6 or 3.7. So we would need to be at 4.1 or 4.2. Over the next month or two, that lowest trailing average, which right now is a, a whole year ago, is going to start to tick up. So we would have to get to 4.1 or 4.2 in the next couple months. But assuming we got to 4.1 or 4.2 percent unemployment in the next couple months, that would be a huge indicator. It would be a huge red flag to the Fed that we could be heading towards a recession. And so, I think if we see another tick up of unemployment by by a, a tenth or, a or two tenths of a point over the next couple months. I think that in and of itself could trigger a rate drop. Also, I mean, AJ, you said it yourself. Um, it's not just one number they're looking at. This is a puzzle. And I've talked about this before, that when you're looking at the economy, um, you, you have all these puzzle pieces and, and you need to, to get a bunch of pieces together before you actually have a picture start to emerge. But that's what I was talking about earlier, is that we're starting to see more than just that CPI number start to drop. We're seeing PPI drop. We're seeing retail sales come down. Um, we're seeing import prices come down. We're seeing consumer and business sentiment come down. Um, lots of things kind of all coming together to indicate that we may be seeing a trend down in inflation. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a trend down lower than the target. Remember, we were so far above that 2% target that we could see a trend down, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. But we could fly through that 2% target and we could see inflation go to zero. We could see inflation go negative. And we need to worry about that. And so right now, we need to be watching to see, is this trend back to pre-pandemic levels? Or are we going to blow through pre-pandemic -pre levels and keep going? And, and two, I think, so first of all, yes, everything there. We also have to remember that inflation is really easy to cause. It is really hard to stop. So you pump 
four trillion dollars into the economy by ramping up the printing press, and overnight you can cause inflation. Well, it's really it's really hard to to get out of it without breaking like causing a recession. Like we could jack up interest rates to twelve percent, twenty percent, and then all of a sudden inflation would be gone. No, no, but that's not true because that actually doesn't hold. If you look back in the history, even in the history of the United States, the levels that inflation had to get before they even started to turn a corner were astronomical. We're talking 18 plus percent. And so, you know, it's you just can't get four trillion dollars out of the economy. It, it doesn't work like that. And so and you're right. Break. You would have to destroy things like you would have to evaporate debt, bankruptcies, things like that to get it to go really, really fast. You, I mean, basically like a depression. And you, and, you, and, you, and you remember, like you guys talk about pre-pandemic, I just pulled up the stat, but I mean, since pre-pandemic, rents are th- between 32 and 36% higher today than they were pre-pandemic. Those aren't, you're not going back to pre-pandemic levels. This is it. You're at 32% higher. At best, you're getting to zero and therefore it's not going high, it's not going up any higher. But it's not like rents were, you know, two thousand dollars a month, and, and now they're going to go back to two thousand. They're going to be at that thirty, a third more, which is almost what another thousand bucks or whatever. Uh, you're not going back to pre-pandemic levels, and that's part of the problem. That's the problem with inflation in general, uh, is that it's cumul- it's cumulative. So even if you go to two percent today, is not what it was four years ago. Two percent inflation today is much more on an overall impact to a, a family whose income hasn't gone up than it was four years ago. It's not all bad though. Like average wages, I just, I saw a headline that average wages have surpassed inflation for the last 12 months. So like they're catching up, like obviously they, it's, they have a little ways to go still, but like they're on the right track. And yes, it went up that much, but wages have gone up too. And as, as long as they continue to surpass current inflation. Yeah, but here's one thing I was thinking about the wages thing the other day too, which, which, we, which, which we talked about, I think it was one of my outstanding arguments from last episode about, you know, why the government doesn't like inflation, but you got to account for the taxes you got to pay on the inflation. So your wages may have gone up 10%, but once you factor in your taxes, you didn't get 10% in your pocket. You got to pay your tax, your 20, 25%, whatever the average tax rate is for everyone that thousand dollars. So, I mean, well, but your no- debt, your net still was up 10%, Mauricio. Like that's not, it d- doesn't matter. So like you, you get taxed on a hundred thousand dollars, you get taxed 30%. If your wages go up by, you know, that's, so you take home 70 if you go up to 110,000, you get taxed 30%. And you're, so your net net still goes up 10%. It doesn't matter. Back, back in the napkin calculations um, that I've done say that if we get inflation at around 2% and we can keep wage growth at, at 5% or a little bit more than 5%, then we have a delta of 3%. So we're basically, we're, we're catching up at 3% a year. Compound that, I believe it's about five years before we see basically our standard of, of living, our, our costs come back to where they were pre-pandemic. And so basically we need a couple things to happen. We need inflation to keep going down and stay down. We need wage, wage growth to keep going up and stay up. And we need that to stick around for five to seven years. And so best case scenario, things get better in five to seven years without every all hell breaking loose and everything breaking. Um, and that's why I believe that that real estate values are likely to stay flat for the next five to seven years, because um, that trend line, that inflation trend line needs to catch up to values, uh, I believe, before there can be much more uh, uh, runway for, for real estate values to con- continue to go up. But long story short, I, I think this is going to be an issue for best case five to seven years, um, unless there's a major recession that it basically works as a clearinghouse. That's what I was going to say. Like, that's all great. And oh, we got to average x percent five percent wage growth over the next whatever many years but yeah that assumes there's no recession over the next five years i mean the recession gonna wipe all that stuff out yeah so unemployment doesn't go up yeah yeah and, and that's why i said that's the best case now and this is the i think once again this is the sensitive part with inflation because t- the social aspect of this i mean i think we can all agree that the united states is like a tinderbox right now like we're going into Probably the most debated, scary, you know, president election that the United States has had in generations. And you are already tapping people out that what inflation does is across the board, you're stressing people out. They're trying to survive. And so you didn't have that 
even if the inflation rate of growth is at 1%, it doesn't matter. They're still tapped out. So it, like whether it's 1% or 4%, people can't afford anything. So any little change at this point right now, it, it, it's people are so sensitive. They're so stressed out. They're so tapped out. They don't know how they're going to pay their bills. You're going to get an exaggerated effect. And I think they're very nervous about this where it's like, I mean, if you had a pop of inflation, jump up to 4% for two months right now in the United States, you're going to crush the middle class. It's very sensitive when you have such massive price levels in increase in such short period of time. And with the, uh, with the, uh, presidential, uh, well, not debates, but election coming up, I think I really do believe they're they're pretty scared. Yeah, and this is again, it's, I, I've been talking about this quite a while, and nobody else seems to be talking about it. So maybe I'm just completely out of whack. And I was actually going to ask uh, the, the the guys that uh, that I saw over the weekend, but you know, I, I call it this. Th- I need a better name for it, but I call it the third spouse problem, which is like you know, this has been going on for for decades and decades and decades. You know, again, going back to the 1940s, 1950s. I mean, we've had inflation. The, the difference, I think, is that at some point back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. When people were tapped out and they couldn't couldn't handle it anymore, they introduced their spouse into the marketplace, right? So now now it's a two income family because that's the only way they can make it survive. Now we get to the point where they're maxed out now, and with the two income families, they can't they're tapped out. They don't have a third spouse to come into the marketplace to kind of bail them out like they did back in the fifties and sixties or whatever. So I just don't know how they're going to do it other than everybody bunking up together because that hasn't been happening too. People have been you know, sharing, you know, instead of buying their own house or renting an apartment, they, they got to rent it with two or three people because they just can't afford to uh, to do that. I love how everybody's just doing their beards, by the way. Like, this is amazing. Like, I was going to comment on that. If you guys are watching on YouTube, has anybody noticed that uh, uh, Kyle's Kyle's beard has grown exponentially? Kyle's beard is like inflation uh, back in uh, 2022. It's going I made, I made a comment to Jay before we started. I was like, my beards get pretty long, getting to the point where I have to comb it. And I was like, you know what? This next podcast, I'm going to sh- I'm going to brush my beard whenever AJ does because AJ, like we already talked about this compulsive brusher, and so like I was I was like, how long is it going to take him to figure out that I'm brushing my beard every time that he brushes his? And it, we made it to I don't know what what hour. Well, I brought it up, but he he doesn't right? he doesn't notice because when he brushes it, he looks down. So he looks down when he brushes. So he's not going to see what's going on. I don't know. This is because I don't know I'm doing it. <laughs> like, but I did notice Kyle and I noticed, oh, he's doing this every time I am. And I'm like, I can out comb Kyle. There's <laughs> no way that he can keep going as long as I'm going. Do we need to get branded drunk real estate combs, uh, like beard combs with the drunk real estate logo on them? This is what mine looks like. I got one of these. I have that exact same one. Not in my hand right now. It's in the office. But I was, hold on, I was gonna say this. That's something that you have zero concerns about is finding a beard comb in my home, because I can't grow a beard on my face to save my life. All right, Jay, get it out. Whatever you're trying to say. Yeah, I think we've exhausted this segment, but I will point out that um, I I think based on Mauricio, his last comment on the topic, um, I maybe we're predicting that uh, this country is moving towards polygamy, and and we're gonna see some three spouse households uh, popping up just to fight inflation and, and the Mormons are, the Mormons are going to win. We like, it's about time. We've been saying this for how long? I, okay. Before we end the segment, I do want to point out just a, a little win. I feel like it was a little win that um, Powell during his press conference last time did note the possibility that non-farm par- payrolls have been overstated. He noted the possibility so I took that as a huge, a huge win because I've been saying from the beginning, those non-farm payrolls are BS. I um, saw it and literally that was the first thing I, I thought of. I'm like, oh, Kyle, we're, like, we're going to hear this. But does that mean he's setting the, does that mean he, is he setting the table so that when the numbers get to whatever they are and they're supposed to now do something, they're going to be like, well, you know, I know we said that we would do that when this number came to 4.2 or whatever, but yeah, they're a little bit overstated. So we're not quite ready to do what we're supposed to be doing. Well, you know what, the, the, and the problem is, is they they fact check themselves. They just don't tell anyone. They have this other thing called the QCEW, where it's the I don't know what it stands for. I forget. Uh, quarterly Census of Employment and Wages. So the problem is, it takes them forever to come out with it, right? But this this gauge is supposed to be like ninety five percent of jobs. It's supposed to encapsulate like ninety five percent of the jobs. Versus these other things we talked about it before are surveys with only thirty percent response rates. So 
Um, for 2023, you know how far off they were when they did their their check? They were yeah. short 735,000 jobs. So when they did the QCEW shore up, it was 70, 735,000 less. So think about that. Like if we, if all of a sudden every month it was coming in, what, what's that? Like 60,000 60. less every time? Like we wouldn't be saying, oh, robust job market. Uh, it would be, it would be much different rhetoric going on. And we didn't have any revisions either too. Take those revised numbers and take away 60,000. And then, then we're talking Then we're cooking with gas. All right, let's move on. Uh, if we didn't fire up AJ enough, we basically put in our nest, next segment just for AJ to vent, I think, because he like he he proposed this topic and we're like, what do you mean? He's just like, just do it. And so AJ pointed out a trend in social media, particularly X, artist formerly known as Twitter, uh, disgruntled LPs and and people like that have been putting sponsors on blast. They're basically calling them out. And it's difficult for me to sift through all these different feuds and super long threads and stuff and deleted accounts. So AJ, why don't you just, the mic is yours. No timer on this one. Just tell us what's been going on and why this is pissing you off so much. I have wanted to rant on this for like a week now. So thank you. I appreciate you guys allowing me to vent here. So, <laughs> um, but no, this is actually a very interesting topic, especially amongst uh, us real estate investors. Summary here, what's been going on on the Twitter sphere, the X space. Uh, I don't actually get onto Twitter very much. Last week, um, I was like, oh, I'll check out what's going on. And I was frankly shocked by what was happening. Basically, Twitter had just blown up and it was a few accounts that were posting about certain people that were syndicators or general partners and GPs. And they were systematically targeting and going after them for not only uh, returns or their lack of performance and all sorts of different things and saying that they were frauds, that they were screwing people like very wild stuff. Um, and in fact, some very large accounts uh, that have 150 plus thousand followers have left the platforms. They completely went off social media. And it was interesting because some of these people um, that left are well respected and known. And uh, the stuff that was being put out of uh, put out on them it was kind of like this hearsay stuff or it was like an investor was mad. And what happened was though, when these individuals were doing it, these weren't LPs. These weren't even the investors of the, uh, of the people, but the mobs gathered around and some of these posts had like a million views and people were cheering them on and saying, go after them and, uh, you know, get them. Now, it's important to note, note the people they were going after have not lost anyone's money. They didn't lose people's money. It was for a lack of performance. And in a bunch of cases, it was to that they paused distributions. Now, the LPs on the platform and people, investors, I don't know if they were their individuals or not, but all these people getting on, just they all went nuts and like how these people are failures and they're, they're screwing people and they're taking advantage of all of these people. Once again, they didn't lose money. They, they didn't lose their investors money. Did they pause distributions? Yeah. I think in some cases, yes. Was performance not to mark? Yes, absolutely. And the reason why this was so impactful for me was for a few reasons. First of all, I was shocked what I was seeing that it was wild. Um, and Twitter just blew up millions and millions of people you know, tens of thousands of comments, the reaches were insane with what was going on. And uh, um, it was by name, individuals, companies, they were posting screenshots of their decks from years ago. They were posting screenshots of emails or communications to investors. They were posting supposedly LPs 
text messages and things, which you don't know. It's just a picture of a text message, and they're stating it's some things. The accounts that we're doing it were all Aon accounts, anonymous, meaning nobody knows who these people are. And that was the first very intriguing thing. But the rate, I mean, you know, when you're on X or social media, there's always stuff where people are fighting, going back and forth. But this sucked the whole entire community in. This was all real estate investors and general partners and people. They all got sucked into this. And it was, people were shocked and people were like, well, what's going on? And the whole environment of it, though, the reason why I think it set me off and caught me interesting was for two reasons, both the general partners and the LPs. And I, I thought it was interesting because, first of all, what is failure, right? What does this mean? But these are parties that all agreed to take a risk on the market. These are not parties that were taken advantage of. They didn't lose their money. They're all still participating. They own their assets. That's not what happened here. They're all, they still own them. They're all invested. These are operations that are still ongoing, right? And two, we are in the middle of, you know, for commercial real estate, we're in a recession, right? I mean, it, it is bad. If you haven't seen the Wall Street Journal or any other publication for the last year ripping or not ripping on, but talking about what happens to real estate in 8%. Storage, we had the worst year in the history of our industry ever. I mean, the rate drop we saw was unlike anything, even in the Great Recession that we'd ever seen. Now, this is not due to any of those investors' problem. Like, they're operating in it, they're working in it, right? But it's one thing if somebody was like a Ponzi scheme, taking advantage or two had lost their investors' money and wasn't doing anything about it, right? Th those are different. That's not what we're talking about here. Um, and so the mob that gathered around and were uh, attacking, I think that what it had to do more was I realized this is the first time any of these people have ever been in a down market. These, first of all, general partners and LPs, I'm going to rip on them both. Um, I think general partners were so afraid of their investors, they didn't pause distributions till it was too late. And a lot of that caused capital calls. Why? They wanted their investors to be happy. And so they gave them funds. They drained accounts when they shouldn't have. Well, and, and AJ, a lot of them have done it in the past. I'm not going to name names, obviously, but I know plenty of operators that when it's through that transition pay phase, the first couple of years of an, of an investment, they will be paying in investors their distributions when they shouldn't be because historically they've been able to come back and make it up later. And so they that kind of just become their common practice. Exactly. The market will bail them out and they can run thin line margins and low cash accounts because the market always goes up and it'll bail them out. But they don't want their investors to not get that return, that, that cash statement, Right. So instead of running a business and operating it, they are running an ATM that had a limited supply of money that they just assumed would be replenished, even though they didn't know when the truck was coming in. Now, when this happened, right, they didn't want to look bad. They didn't want to give bad news. They didn't want their numbers to be affected, their returns, their uh, uh, internal rate of return. They didn't want those things to look bad because it would not it would hurt them to get more capital. So in doing so, right, I think a lot of the general partners and operators made bad cash decisions. They should have paused. They should have said, this isn't going around. We don't know where the end of this is. We, we, we shouldn't be draining our accounts. Okay. They didn't want to be the, what I believe is the adult in the room. And um, that is a general partner's mistake. They, and, and two, though, once again, I think like Kyle mentioned, it was the first time they just assumed they, they didn't know how it was going to happen. Now, I, I understand that. But the next side was the LPs, that when operators pause distributions, now investors said, you're failing. We've failed, right? Um, this is interesting to me as someone that has been doing this for 20 years and been through the great financial crisis. And I actually see when people fail, when they lose all their money, when they go bankrupt, when assets go under. And pausing distributions is not that. You, if you think that an investment should pay you an ever-growing rate of return in cash flow, 
no matter what the market cycles are, no matter what happens, you should not be investing. It's plain and simple. You shouldn't be. Well, the worst and the worst part is to me, AJ, is that it's it's just what's been created over the last decade. Because even if you brought over an investor from you know a traditional stock market investor, they're used to not having down. Like all the time, the stock market goes down, and they don't call up their stockbroker, be like, "Hey, what's going on?" Because it happens all the time. Like it, it just literally hasn't happened over the last decade with real estate. So all of a sudden, the, people have gotten used to it, and they're like. Oh my God, just because this is the longest cycle that we've had in real estate ever without, without a recession, it's like people forget that we had, we've had previous recessions with real estate. And two, not only that, you, this is an alternative asset that, it, it, you know, when you look at real estate, first of all, it is a total return. It's over the long term. Real estate isn't a short term investment. And two, long term isn't two to three years, people. That is not how this works. I mean, we're looking at a decade. If you look at our assets and our performance, even our best ones that we've ever had, we had years where they didn't perform good. That, of course that happens. Why would I ever expect in a 10 year period of time that we wouldn't have years of either underperformance, market volatility, and where the plan had to change, right? And so when I, I think that it was surprising to me because of this, that all of a sudden, when people saw markets that they went after the general partners and say, we were scammed because you paused distributions. It doesn't mean they're not going to make the returns that were stated. It doesn't mean that in five years, the plan's been executed. They've made incredible returns, everything else. They didn't fail. Right. And so I, that, that was surprising. It was also surprising to me how the general partners, they run from their investors. They don't want to say no. They don't want to say there's bad things happening. And instead, they avoid it. They won't up front. No. And two, I stand by pausing distributions. This was the good thing to do. It was the right thing to do. We should be financially conservative in unknown times. We should keep cash in the bank. And I shouldn't be just distributing cash in markets where occupancy and rates are dropping. That is not a smart financial decision. With the cash is still in the bank account. You didn't lose it. It's still there. It's still in the property, right? But we don't know what the future will hold. So we're going to pause distributions, let the markets rebound. And when we're comfortable with rates, occupancy, stable ground, then we can continue and resume distributions or whatever that may look like. That is completely reasonable. And not only is it reasonable, it is responsible for general partners to do it. And the way that they, I feel like they reacted and hid and ran and didn't want to talk about it, that they were ashamed or embarrassed. I, that was confusing to me. You should actually stand up in front of your investors. That's why they give you money is so you can make hard decisions and that you will be the responsible party when things are going wrong. That is why you are managing their money, right? It is not to give them the only investor that has ever given a standardized return over the long period of time and not been subject to market fluctuations was Bernie Madoff. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> That's it. And But this isn't even just a real estate phenomenon. I mean, you look at companies uh, on the S&P 500, you're looking at uh, companies in the NASDAQ, you're looking at companies in the Dow Jones, trillion dollar companies um, over the last couple of years have been cutting dividends, some cutting dividends 100%. I mean, companies like Boeing, companies like Hasbro, companies like, um, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the, the, the other super big name companies, um, Ford, Walt Disney. I don't, know if, I don't know if Boeing's a great example to say that like, uh, like <laughs> they might have done it to themselves. But, but it's a blue chip. And so what I'm saying is it, it happens to every business on the planet at some point or another. And yeah, if, if you, if you invest in a stock, if you're, if you're a stock market investor, you've probably, if you've done this long enough, you know that this is part of the cycle. And if you're a real estate investor and you've done this long enough, you know, this is part of the cycle. The problem is we've had 10 years of a bull market where this hasn't happened. And a lot of people have started investing over the last 10 years. And so in their minds, this doesn't happen. This isn't a thing. And it, it's really hard. And, and um, I, I, 
I, I, I want to take some responsibility for it because we have a lot of first time investors in that invest with us in, in, in our company. A lot of people that have come to us, they've never invested in a syndication before. So they do invest with us and we've paused distributions on a couple properties. Um, and in fact, the first property we paused dis- distributions on uh, Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we were like a year sooner than like any other company out there. Um, yeah. And, and, and it wasn't because we were worried about losing the property. It's because we didn't want to ever have to think about a capital call. We didn't ever, ever want to have to think about being in a position where we'd have to negotiate with the bank. We would have rather pause distributions and, and be super conservative and, and bulk up reserves so that capital calls were never in our vocabulary. Foreclosure was never in our vocabulary. And the investor's money that you was still there. That's the important thing. It was still there. Well, I think we had something like a million bucks in the bank. Pause distributions. Yeah, exactly. And and I remember going to investors and ha- having this conversation. And it was a really hard conversation, harder than I expected. Because in my mind, I guess because I've been investing for a lot longer than a lot of our investors, um, in my mind, it was always assumed that this isn't an ATM, that you're not always going to hit your preferred return. Um, but I was I, I did a really poor job of putting myself in my investor's shoes my investors who have seen the market just go up for 10 years and never even considered that there was a possibility that this was going to happen. And I think that's part of, I, as, as, a, as a syndicator, I'm going to take some of the responsibility here. I should have done a better job of educating my investors. And we all do it. We all say past performance is an indicative uh, indicator of a future performance. And we, and we all, we, we have all of these, all of these, legal things that are in the documents. Um, preferred return isn't guaranteed return, all those sorts of things, but nobody really thinks about it. And, and, and we as operators maybe have to do a better job of, well, not anymore because I think they already know it, but we probably could have done a better job, uh, two, three, five years ago of, of being more plain about the fact that, Hey, preferred return, isn't your guaranteed cash flow, um, and things like that. And Me so, too. I, I made that mistake. In fact, I made the mistake because it, it was my first time taking investors. We'd invested our own capital, and everything like, so like you, Jay, Oh, that was normal. I made the mistake when they're like, Hey, show me like, what, what does this look like? Like what my preferred, I'm like, well, we have some charts and stuff, but I'm like, but this doesn't really mean anything as far as distributions. Cause this is value add. Well, just what does it look like? Don't worry. We'll never hold you to anything. Right. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that was not. Well, and obviously we're going to show our past performance too. past performance. Doesn't, you know, indicate any future performance, but, but we are going to show them our track record, right? And when you show a track record of, okay, this was supposed to be a five-year hold. We sold it in two years and we gave you a 44% return. Like, yes, they're not going to expect that, uh, oh, we're going to hold the next one for five years anymore because we, the last three, we sold after two years, <laughs> you know, like we said five and we actually did it in two. And so yes, past performance, but that was our track record of what we were doing because the market did. But I want to, I want to bring this back to, to Twitter a little bit. And I think this, um, the Twitter thing, it's, it, it shows what's great about Twitter, but it also shows what's awful about Twitter. And you, you, you touched on both. And I think that the great thing about Twitter is it does give people a platform that didn't have it before. Like if you like this was this has kind of been historically up until the, the last few years, it's kind of been a cloak and dagger industry a bit where there hasn't haven't really been much many ways to like figure out what's going on with operators or figure out like what actual track records are, or if something's going wrong and something like Twitter allows somebody who has information and historically wasn't able to get it out to get it out there. So that's great. It's, I think there are plenty of bad operators out there who need to, people need to know about, there needs to be a forum for someone to be able to figure out where there's when an operator is bad. And that's not too, by the way, when I'm talking about that, that wasn't one, but there are plenty bad players. I'm not saying that. There, there are absolutely plenty b- bad players. There are people that shouldn't have taken money. The, yeah, we're like, I want to make that sure. It's very clear. That's not right. what and, I'm talking and about. And like someone yeah. like, you know, if, if you watch some of these foreclosures, like the, the worst ones I see are these the things that happened to foreclosures and syndications where the operator went out and they did a capital call and then still got foreclosed. And so like, not only did they get foreclosed upon, they took more money from their investor and then lost it all. So like the, the, there should be more ways for people to be able to voice concerns and talk about bad, bad operators when there is a bad situation. 
The problem is, is that we right now are living in like this outrage society where outrage gets clicks and outrage gets traction to AJ's point. That's how you get a million views is by putting, you know, putting outrage on top of something. And so the problem is people exaggerate and people do it anonymously. So you could do it with zero repercussions. And to me, like a forum where me, Kyle Wilson goes out and I make a statement as myself and I make a claim, then someone can come back at me and dispute my claim. And then we can have a dis, you know, a discourse back and forth and we could decide, you know, one side and the other, and people can make their own informed decisions. The problem is right now with, with these things like Twitter, Instagram, I'm seeing the same thing happen on Instagram. I, I have a friend of mine who's going through it on Instagram. Luckily he's, he hasn't left the platform. Like AJ was saying, some people left, he's standing up for it. He's fighting it. Um, so good on him for doing that. But the problem is it's these anonymous things. And that's what he, he asks. He's like, who, who are you? Like, the, the, he has one account attacking him. He's like, who are you? Stand up and say who you are, and we'll talk about this. And, but and the, pro it, the, the problem is even worse because as syndicators, though, we cannot talk openly on these platforms. This is the problem. So when you're on there, you just can't go on there and say anything. We can't do that as syndicators and operators. We just can't go and start disclosing information, things like that, because Mauricio would would kill us. So we have to be careful about what we're saying. So it also leads to an environment where people can just go crazy, say anything. And it actually makes it hard to, I think, defend yourself. Right. And actually back those claims up. Now, I think it's the two parts because I'm not even defending necessarily GPs. I want to make sure it's clear when I started this, I'm saying the general partners and the LPs, I was ticked at the whole conversation about it. Right. They, they were, I was bothered by both. I was bothered that the general partners, including me, including me, did not educate their investors like Jay was talking about. We assumed way too much. I assumed way too much. I thought that accredited investors that were investing $200,000, that they're insured. that was stupid of me. I don't know why I would assume that. They hadn't done what we had. So I did not do a good enough job, and we try to be very open. We try to get it right and put it. This doesn't mean this will happen. Our target goal is a long-term six-year, uh, you know, refinance goal. Short-term, I don't know. Like it, that's not how it works. Nobody knows from year to year what's going to happen. That's why real estate is a long-term game. We can't predict markets, right? But we're in it for the long term, and that's the whole point. We can survive bad markets and good markets. That's that's what I love about real estate, right? And so I, I want Mauricio to chime in here a little bit about uh, maybe the legal perspective. And also, I think this is a good example of so the SEC, when they're talking about changing the accredited investor rule, they're br talking about bringing in a test, right? So that that way, like someone's taking the test, and I'm sure the test, whatever it's going to be, is going to lay this out a lot better than we can and say, look, like, here's past examples of, um, you know, people in down markets, losing money and yada, yada, yada. So Mauricio, like, is it like, what's the, what's the legal perspective on this on people just kind of sounding off and, and, and expecting things that weren't promised. And I, I know that's why we, we pay you is for, so people don't expect this, but it's the onus is still on us, I guess, to educate them. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I can talk about the legal part in a second, but I mean, this is obviously a symptom of a much, this whole Twitter thing is just a symptom of a larger problem or a larger sentiment, which is just LPs are pissed in general. I mean, it's, and for a variety of different reasons. I mean, Jay, you and I were keynoting best ever, and that was a sentiment we got. It's actually my number one performing Instagram post is, is a rant I did on, hey, GPs, LPs are pissed. Uh, and I think, I think Jay hit it right on the head. I think, I mean, I'll be honest, you're kind of not really playing devil's advocate. You know, I, I see a lot of these every year. We do a ton of these every year. I see all these business plans, all these people talking, and, and it, it, I think it has to do with setting expectations on the front end. I mean, when you're there but well, not you, but most syndicators. And again, there's a lot of new syndicators who've never done this before that they're basically presenting on the front end. This is your cash on cash distribution. You're going to be getting a 6% the first year, 8% the second year. There's no mention in there that there's a possibility that, you know, at some point there may not be a cash flow. So they have this expectation setting up. And so I, I do think the GPs bear some responsibility by not, you know, just setting the expectations up front. I mean, if you set up the expectation up front properly, say, look, there's no, I know we say it. And obviously from a legal standpoint, I would say everybody's covered because it's all disclosed in the PPM. That's the whole point. You have a PPM is to disclose all these potential risks and, you know, what have you. So uh, I think that's part of it. And then to be fair, again, maybe to take maybe the other side, I know, I know AJ, you were not defending GPs, but the reality is some people are not you guys, but some people 
to your point, AJ, it took too long to stop distributions. And so some people stopped distributions because they didn't have enough cash to even make the payment to the mortgage. Like their deals were in trouble. And that's the reason they cut distributions, not because they were like, hey, let's just cut distributions because it let's be conservative. Times are we're heading into some tough waters. We the prudent thing here to do would be to cut distributions. No, a lot of I would say the majority of GPs had to cut distribution because they had to. They didn't have a choice. They didn't they, they didn't have enough debt coverage ratio to even cover the distributions. And and so that's plays into it as well. And they were it's because they were scared. They're terrified of their LPs because guess what? When you do that, people get upset. They don't like it. They want that check in the mail, which is understandable, but that's why you're a general partner. I'm going to throw one other thing out there. And and I've seen some of these. Uh, I, I wasn't familiar with it until AJ brought it up, but I, I've been looking the last day or two. And I've seen some of these conversations. And some of this vitriol is not necessarily uh, aimed at your average GPs. I've noticed that in some cases, um, this is this is aimed at people who um, are, are probably best described as, as gurus in the industry, whether it be business industry or real estate industry. Um, and and there's some people who um, I think it's safe to describe them as having large egos and kind of being those folks on social media that kind of have no issue flaunting their success and their wealth and maybe even putting other people down or basically saying it's easy to make lots of money and blah, 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 blah. And for those people, I, I imagine that, that a lot of the people attacking them, there's some sort of, it, it's, it's a, 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 a uh, what's the German word? Uh, Schadenfreude. Um, basically you're, 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 you're reveling in their, uh, in their, in their demise, in their struggles. Um, you see all these people that told you how easy it was to, to get rich quick. And now suddenly they're struggling and, and cut distributions. So screw you guys. Ha ha ha. And so I, I think there's definitely some of that going on as well. Um, and I think it's a good reminder to us as GPs that we need to stay humble. Um, that because a, a lot of us, I know we're, we're saying how our LPs have kind of fallen into this lull thinking this is easy and, and, and you don't, you just, you just make money month over month over month and everything goes your way. I think a lot of GPs have fallen into the same, uh, the same attitude over the last 10 years. And so it's a good reminder. To well, us. I think a lot of them to that point are just ne- like, they literally have never been through it. So I think you almost get God complexes. I can't fail because they'd never seen others fail. They don't fail and they win just by buying like, and I think you're exactly right, Jay. Now I, I think to put a kind of final touch on this here. Um, I first want to say we, once again, I am not, I am not defending general partners or those people. Are, I'm actually like, that's how it started out. It's w- this idea that once again, you are doing things you, what I think you should be as in you're trying to appease investors and you are trying to not look bad. That is really bad when you're investing people's money, because the only thing you should care about is risk and return. And you shouldn't give a return and do things in the short term to make yourself look good because you are nervous, right? At the end of the day, real estate's a long-term game. And it's about performing well over the long term. The number one thing general partners should be worried about is losing money. It is doing capital calls. Now, a lot of general partners, right, they are new. And that's that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, But I think Jay's right. A lot of them, maybe they didn't know what to do with investors. They didn't know how to communicate. So I think a lot of this comes down to is you have a lot of limited partners and general partners that are new and they're reacting now to troubled times. I I guess I I don't even, it's hard to even say it's not like once again, these people aren't failing. That's not what we're talking about, but not markets going up. And this is the first time that they've encountered and expectations are not playing out how they thought. And they're not sure how to have these conversations, how to handle it. I'm including myself. So because I didn't have investors, I didn't know. And we made decisions and we made decisions we didn't have to make. We didn't charge fees all last year. We cut all the fees out that uh, we charged from our investment investors. We didn't even really communicate that 
to our investors at all. We didn't really tell them just because I guess we didn't think we'd need to or anything. But it's not like we didn't take profit. We actually took millions out of our personal bank accounts to float that. And, and that essentially is transferred to the investors. It pays for the companies and the fees and the works and everything. Now, that is not an expectation that people should have, but it was a failure on my part to not even communicate necessarily what we were doing just because I thought, oh, this is a nice thing that, right, we want to do. Um, and we thought that it, it was just a decision we made, right? We didn't have to. The funds weren't losing money. That's not why we did it, right? Um, but we felt, I, I guess, responsible. We, we just wanted to do a good thing. Now, when you look at this, though, it's really important to understand that is not normal, but general partnerships, they're running companies. So they too, they actually have to pay bills. They are businesses. And I think there is a lot of people that think that that should either just happen or they should take a hit. And that is also a dangerous th uh, position to be in is where you start to get into a name, name game and a blame uh, point of view. So, in order to have good conversations with your investors, I think it's important to be transparent, to educate them, right? And to make sure that you reassure them that we're, this is our plan, we're executing it. But most importantly, we don't make short-term knee-jerk decisions predicated on short-term market fluctuations. And I think a lot of limited partners are expecting that, demanding that. I think that because I hear it. Well, you should just sell this asset off or you should just make radical changes. Now, this is hard for if you take anybody's money because you have, you created the plan, you have the strategy, you're the one guarding people's money, you have to make hard decisions. And that is your job. And I think general partners, you need to stand by it and you need to stand by the decisions you made because you're doing it on their behalf. And you're doing it because it's the right thing to do. If you do that, then you're going to communicate openly to them. You're going to be very open why you're doing it, why it's in the best uh, uh, for them, right? And then I think in general, that should make limited partners and your investors. They should be understanding, right? Uh, because you are being upfront and keeping along. Where the problem happens is when you play catch up. I didn't know that. And I'm speaking about myself. Well, you didn't tell me that. Or I didn't really know that that was going on. That's what people don't like. Investors don't like surprises. General partners, we got to not surprise them. That's what happened. That's what's happening, AJ, is that the, a lot of them are just not, that's what really they're pissed off is I think for the vast, not for the vast, but a lot of the syndicators, they're not communicating. They're not doing what you guys are doing, which is communicating, overly communicating, making sure everything's clear. They're deciding to stick their head in the sand. And some of these LPs find out they lost all their money because they read it on the real deal or something. And they found out their property got foreclosed yesterday and they didn't even have even know from the sponsor. So I think that's part of where a lot of the frustration is coming from the LPs, not to not to defend them. And they, they, need, they need to understand there's risk and it's not an ATM to your point. But uh, anyway, I think that's just uh, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon that we're going through. I mean, I, I'm going to bring up an example of what I think is here. It's all about risk reward, right? There's a reason that people invest in these large syndications, and it's because they could achieve great returns. You've seen it through the great times. People were getting 20, 30% returns annualized on their investments. But all of that comes with the downside risk as well. If, if you could just put it in a treasury and get at this point, you know, 5%, then that's no risk. And that's what your risk, your, your risk level is zero risk, 5% return. As that, as that return goes up, the risk goes up. And so that's why people in, uh, invest in these things. And it was a few, it was years back. And uh, Jay and I, we were, um, as, as we do in this industry, we have friends who are doing the same stuff and they were raising a massive fund. And they approached us about investing it and they'd invested in our, our deals. And so we said, sure, we'll, we'll put some money in your fund. But they're in the same industry as us. They were multifamily. And so there was two, two opportunities in, in order to go in the fund. You could go with straight equity with the huge upside. So if the, if the, if the fund does awesome, you, get, you could potentially get those amazing returns. Or there was another opportunity where it was straight 9%. You only get 9% return. There's no upside. But the thing is, it was, it was um, lower in the capital stack or higher, depending on what you said. But it, it got, it, that money was more protected or pref 
to the common equity. And so the point was, is that if there's, it has less risk, if anything happened with these properties and they had to sell for a loss, then they would sell off the common equity first before it got to that preferred equity to that 9%. And so um, when I looked at it, I said, okay, they're in the same industry as us. Multifamily is really hot right now. We obviously put all our, a ton of our own money in our own deals in multifamily, just as straight equity. We feel more comfortable putting money just at the 9%. It's not a great return comparatively to what we've been getting, but it's very protected. It's, it's, it's at that point where it's, you know, like a lot would happen for it to lose. Well, a lot has happened. So now we just got a, we, we got a statement from that fund and it's to the point where it's 70% of the common equity, if you had to sell right now, 70% of that common equity would be gone. But you know what? That pref equity that I invested in, I only got 9%. It is still fully, would at this point still be fully paid back. So that's just an example of when you were looking at these, these investments, you have to say, yes, okay, they're projecting 13% returns, 14% returns, whatever they're projecting as far as returns. Like that's more than 5%. 5% is the risk-free, the risk-free rate that you can get. If you're getting that much higher than 5%, then there is risk and you have to look at it a little bit more closely. You have to do your due diligence and understand why you're getting that premium on the risk-free rate. Well said. Okay. We ready to wrap this up? Well, I feel better. This was a really good therapy session. Kyle, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome, AJ. I, I speak, I think, the, uh, the all three of us that uh, we appreciate when you get heated. I don't know if you're sweating. But uh, you oh, should I be. Am. <laughs> um, Jay, what segment should we do next? What do you think? I think we should leave it up to Mar No, let's not leave it up to Mauricio. Let's just do the top 10. Let's do the top 10. I think we should do a top 10. <laughs> um, I, I thought we'd do a little fun one here because I knew we we're talking about Twitter. So I was going to do the top 10 most liked tweets of all time. And so for you, for, for Mauricio, I know you're an old guy. You don't really know what likes are. That's when someone sees something and they hit the like button so that, uh, you know, th that th indicate that they agree with whatever was, uh, was posted or just that they like it. So, um, let's do the, they the same as a view. Well, no, a, a, a like is actually, you have to go in and like it. I know you're just messing with me. Uh, okay. So top 10, uh, likes of all time. I'm going to start, start on a bit of a sad note. Um, but I think it was a great story. I mean, we don't get a chance to say, like, don't I get a chance to like, you guess? guess? Okay. What do you, what do you think the number one is? What happened to that? We, in the original, in the early episodes, we would guess and he would say, yeah, good guess. Now oh we just, God, go you just want to criticize everything about the top 10. Eh? Go, go ahead. Guess. Dude, what, what was it? The first ever tweet from the, from the, from the Twitter founder. Isn't that like that sold like an NFT for like a bazillion dollars. That's gotta be up there. All right. Well, it's nowhere close to the top 10. Jack Dorsey, Jack Dorsey's first tweet. No, I'm going, I'm going with the Trump tweet. Trump, Trump. I was surprised Trump didn't make the, the list at all. Top 10. Obama. Obama made the list once and Biden made the list. Actually, Obama made the list twice. So, but the number one, you're never going to guess the number one, but is well-deserving to be the number one of all time. Um, it, it was the tweet from the family of Chad, Chadwick Boseman um when he had passed away and so that was one of the craziest stories i've ever seen in my life chad chadwick boseman who was obviously black panther everyone knows he was the like at the time like the superstar like black panther was like the best movie of all time and we find out literally like that he had just died and apparently he had been battling stage three colon cancer since 2016 for four years and didn't tell a soul other than like his, his close knit family. No one in the world knew that he was battling cancer. And then all of a sudden he passed away in uh, 2020. So uh, that tweet got 6.7 million likes. Should I, be, should I be embarrassed that I have no idea who Chadwick Boseman is? Have you ever seen the movie black Panther? I don't watch movies anymore. Uh, drop a comment. If I, if you are with me and you have no idea who Chadwick Boseman is, well, it's Boseman, but that's uh, yeah, there you go. enough. <laughs> but and if you haven't then that means you haven't seen black panther and you should go watch both of them because they're both amazing movies um all right next number two elon musk 4.5 million um was his so a bit of a shift from the uh from the first you know sentimental tweet his tweet was next i'm buying coca-cola to put the cocaine back in it so that had 4.5 <laughs> million likes 
<laughs> Number three, uh, Barack Obama. It was a uh, it was a, a tweet um, in 2017. So he wasn't the uh, the president at that time. This was during Trump's presidency. But he said, "No one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion." So that got 3.7 million. Um, and then Greta Thun Greta Thunberg uh, made number four, 3.6 million. And it, th this was pretty funny. This is when Andrew Tate was coming at her, uh, and Andrew Tate's obviously a, an idiot. Um, he tweeted it at her about taunting her about the emissions in his car collection. And she said, uh, so she was like 15 at the time. And she tweeted back, yes, please do enlighten me. Email me at smalldickenergy at getalife.com. So that got uh, 3.6 million uh, tweets. Um, then Joe Biden, when his first tweet, when he was uh, first inaugurated, he said it's a new day in America, 3.6 million. Uh, Barack Obama talking about Kobe Bryant. Uh, when uh, when Kobe died, so that got three point five. Um, Andy Milanakis, um, he made a joke about um, when uh, when SpaceX launched their rocket and everything was going on with uh, COVID and the pandemic and everything. He said, uh, "Congratulations to the astronauts that left Earth today. Good choice." So that was another funny tweet that got a lot of traction. Is that, is that somebody else that I should know who that is? Andy who? Yeah, you don't, you don't need to know who he is. Okay, all right. He's, he's a comedian. Uh, Greta Thunberg made another one. Uh, also going after at Andrew Tate again. So if you want to look up Andrew Tate versus Greta Thunberg, I'll let you do that on your own. Um, Twitter. She's that like handicapped girl, right? It's like all weird. No, no, no. She was the, she's the like Swedish political activist who like the, um, she's uh, started at like 14 like she did that really passionate speech about climate change. She's all about climate change. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, we know which side AJ's on on that one. I'm glad. I'm glad I got it right. I was like starting to question myself. Am I gonna get this wrong? Um, okay, uh, Twitter snuck in at number nine. Uh, I don't know if you remember back in 2021, uh, all of like uh, Facebook's like things went down for a short while. Facebook was down, Instagram was down, WhatsApp was down, everything. So Twitter just decided to take advantage and they tweeted hello to li literally everyone because everyone the only Twitter was the only thing that they could use. And then um, then when Elon Musk took over Twitter, he tweeted, "I hope that everyone, even my worst critics, remain on Twitter because that's what free speech means." So that was the top ten. Before he started kicking people off for insulting him. Oh, we see what side Jay's on in that one. Okay. All right. I, I, I'm a free speech. I'm a free speech person. So speaking of Twitter, Instagram, um, we got the top three, right? Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Snapchat's in there, but I don't expect Maurice to know what Snapchat is. So between Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, F. Mary Kill. Hit me with it, Jay. What do you got? Kill them all. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, I only, I don't use any of them. I, I'm old. I used to. I, I, That's not true. You're on, you're on Instagram all the time, Jay, I know. And you're always quoting Twitter for like news sources and stuff. So the only thing you. I read Twitter. I don't post on it. My assistant posts on Instagram for me and TikTok. Um, I've posted three things and I think I have 82 followers. Okay, but so you don't check TikTok. So you're killing TikTok is what you're saying. I would kill Twitter. I hate that platform. Kill Twitter, marry Instagram, TikTok. Yep, yep. There you go. You, you guys both agree on that? It's the logical conclusion. Mauricio, what do you got? I'm going to, I've never been on TikTok, so I'm going to kill, kill TikTok. Um, I'm trying to grow my Instagram. I just, you know, been on it for like eight months. So I'm going to marry Instagram. And, uh, but what happened to like LinkedIn and, you know, and, and Facebook? Is that no longer, they're no longer cool? Well, no. So like I was just going based off social media platforms, the, the monthly active users. And so Instagram's got 2 billion active users. TikTok's got 1.2 billion. Snapchat actually has 750 million, but I knew you guys weren't on Snapchat. And then Twitter has 541. So I actually have a Snapchat account. I don't have a TikTok account. There you go. Something you didn't know about Mauricio. Um, all right. Answer the question, though. Didn't I already answer the question? I was going to kill TikTok, marry Instagram, and do whatever with the other one. All right. Um, I kind of agree with that. Uh, TikTok, tell you what, though. I don't know if you guys remember when TikTok came out. It was amazing, right? It was like... You could go, you could spend an hour on there and everything was new and it was awesome. Um, but stop giving me that Jay. I'm, it's, 
you know what? I have my time. You have your time. We're going. We're going on seven hours on this show. I said, I'm saying my piece, um, <laughs> but uh, I can't do TikTok anymore. First of all, it's too addicting, and apparently, it's stealing all my data and sending it to China. That's the algorithm, oh. hands down, by far of any platform. It does. They don't even come close. It is so much more addicting. Right. It's wild. They, they got something there. They 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 put the cocaine back in Coke. Is what they did. Like they they took Instagram and put cocaine back in it. Um, so by default, I'm still on Instagram. I, I stalk my friends on Instagram and Twitter. I still like getting news from. So like uh, it seems pretty good. So, all right. Every time, like next, like we have to put you on a clock. You're so bad about how long, and yet whenever you whenever you're done talking, you have nothing left to say. Then you start doing the hurry up and tell and Dave, Dave, if you're listening to this, Dave, don't cut my rant about jay because last time i put a rant about jay giving me the hurry up thing and you cut it and i don't know if that's because jay's the one who talks to you dave and he told you to cut it because i was ripping on him but don't cut it this time jay needs to be called out i have noticed the selection of cutting is interesting yeah exactly <laughs> let's be clear kyle is is copied on every single email i send to the editor so nothing is ever cut without Kyle knowing it. And I rarely. I, okay. Yeah. That's so you claim everything. I see everything, but shockingly, the last time I call you out on it, then that gets cut out of the podcast. Dave's just a good editor. Dave's a good editor. He knows what to do. I guess so. All right. AJ, since you've been, you've been the biggest supporter here. I love your vibe tonight. You you get the first plug. What do you got here? Uh, let's got to do the book. So I knew it. Um, I had it ready. Oh, you're the man. Thank you. We're a uh, bestseller right now in knowledge, capital, investing basics. I'm number four. Come on. I got to be Benjamin Graham. Um, real estate investing. I've only got I think Brandon Turner to beat. So help me out, everybody. Mauricio, what do you got for us? I'm going to promote. Uh, so if you enjoyed uh, AJ's rant today, uh, the my episode of Real Estate Syndicate Live with AJ himself drops Actually, by the time you watch this, it'll already have dropped. So you can watch it on my YouTube channel, which is Mauricio Raul. It'll be the, the latest video there. But it was a fascinating. He, and he ranted a little bit about his investors in that episode. So go check out the episode with AJ uh, on Real Estate Syndicate Alive, which is on my Mauricio Raul uh, YouTube channel. So I'm getting the feeling you were the accelerator of that seg segment then, Mauricio. You kind of stirred it up in him. <laughs> Dude, I got I to I gotta promote the pod. Uh, Jay, what do you got for us? Uh, I'm going to remind everybody we're doing a live stream next week, Tuesday, June 25th, 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Um, you get to come on, watch us, interact with us. I don't know exactly how this is going to work, but we're going to give it a try and uh, we'll figure it out between now and then. You're going to interact with sober, with Jay sober, low energy, no fun, Jay. Is that I the will plan? not be sober. I promise. In fact, I, I, Mauricio, you and I are going to start early. Yeah, that's true. Jay, you wouldn't have been giving me the hurry up if you were half in the bag right now. You would have just been having fun. It's so. true. I I could have dealt with with the boredom if if I were if I were wasted. The boredom coming from the guy who does the economic segment at the beginning of every, every one of our episodes. Uh, all right, I'm gonna plug my wife because plugging my wife is much more fun. Apparently, um, plug her twice once once on Instagram, uh, badass investor. Once on YouTube, badass investor. Go check her out. And uh, that's all we got. Anything else, boys? And let me just remind remind everybody if you want to if you want to be notified of of the 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 details for next week's live stream, drelive.com or jscott.com, uh, the top link. Either one. Why, why don't you just give them the link direct? Why don't you just give them the link directly? Well, I just registered DRE Live today, and apparently the DN, the DNS hasn't fully propagated. You said you weren't able to pull it up on your phone yet, so if it doesn't work, you can go to jscott.com. But go to DRE Live. Don't give Jay any other. And just drop the link down in the comments, the direct link to the to the. I'll put live. the link in the comments as well. All right. Well, I don't even care about you guys. My drink is gone. It doesn't even matter not. if your drinks are gone. Dude, my yeah. drink is way gone. Woo. Way Both gone. of my drinks are gone. Yeah. yeah dude, good. Jay's all full of chia seed or whatever the fuck he's got in that <laughs> smoothie. Uh, I'm going to go hit the head. I'm excited though for next week when Jay's apparently doing three shots with me, um, live, maybe we'll do a shot with the, the audience live at the end or something. That would be fun. Perfect. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Why the, um, why the end? Maybe that's, maybe that's for people to ask questions. Turn it out. Take a shot. They got to take a shot in order to ask a question. That's true. 
Yeah. In order, in order to, to, to ask a question, you got to do a shot. Uh, it's a great idea. We'll think of some other fun stuff. Uh, but anyway, stay tuned, pay attention. Uh, we're going to cut some of the fun stuff out of the, uh, of the actual podcast. So, uh, make sure you're there live. So you see all of our shenanigans before and after. Um, but I'm going to go hit the head and I will see you next Tuesday. See ya. See you guys.